Well, if you can believe it, we are now 34 sermons into the Mark series. <laughs> and yet again, we've come down to what I think is one of the core questions that Mark is giving an answer to in this book. And that is the question of who is Jesus? Now, Mark answers that directly in the very first verse of the book, but then on many occasions is showing he sh- shows the disciples and others answering or asking that particular question. From the disciples' terror after Jesus calms the storm, when they ask themselves, who is this man? To Peter finally starting to understand and answering but answering, but who do you say I am with you are the Christ, whilst at the same time still misunderstanding what the role of the Christ is. Those of you with good memories will also remember that there's another running theme through the first half of the book of Jesus concealing his claims, concealing his identity, telling the disciples not to tell anyone who he was, telling the healed sick not to, te- not to spread the word, demons to be quiet, etc., Well, today, the secrecy falls entirely away. Jesus has already built up a huge following, and we've come to Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. Now his actions are making a very bold and clear statement about who he is. The time has come for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, Pilate and Herod, to come to and commit to their own answer to that question of who is Jesus. So let's read. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethany and Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and while others spread branches, they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the Twelve. Now, as I said, through most of the book of Mark, there's been an element of hiddenness to his ministry. He's regularly telling the disciples not to tell anyone anything, such as when Peter declares that he's the Messiah. He commands demons not to tell who he is. He tells those he heals not to tell others. But that's all been dispensed with now. Jesus is making a very bold statement in his actions here, and he wants all of Jerusalem to know about it. Now, there's three points I want to draw out for those of you who are taking notes. There's the coming king, the contradictory king, and the divisive king. Now, the way that Jesus is coming here is absolutely loaded with symbolism and claims about who he is and what he has come for. So let's look at what some of these actions here mean. First of all, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding. In that time, 2,000 years ago, when someone is riding into the city at a head of a procession, generally one of two things has happened. Either the city has just been conquered and the one riding on the horse is the general king or governor who's come here to take control of the city, They're at the head of the army with all the forces that just defeated your city following. Typically, the leader is on a mighty horse in a great display of strength. Or the city is welcoming back its victorious army from a conquest. It's the king or the general returning, 
to the adulation of the crowds, displaying the trophies of his conquest. It's the sort of thing that would happen after Greek or Roman victories. I got an example here. This is a, an artist's impression. But you can see a Roman general in the middle on a chariot with horses all around and um, presumably it would be gold. It's the sort of thing that would happen after a great victory, for example, by a king like Alexander the Great or a rebel like Judas Maccabeus or other leaders like that. It's called a triumphal entry because it's an entry that takes place after a great triumph of victory in battle. The modern equivalent would be big military shows of strength, like those put on by North Korea, China, or Russia, par parading all their military hardware about in a great show of strength. Generally, in these ones, the leader isn't riding there. They're just watching them from the sidelines. But you also have more Western parallels, for example, the coronation of Charles last year, or other processions like the British Trooping of the Colour. Now, there's not a perfect parallel between those two analogies because generally all these happen on an anniversary. They don't, they don't come immediately following a great victory. But they're all displays of power and splendor. And so when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem riding, Jesus is implicitly claiming both importance and rule. He's pushing that point about who he is. Now, the triumphal entry wasn't just an accident or coincidence. The crowds just didn't happen to spontaneously turn up. It was a deliberate act on Jesus' part. He goes very deliberately and plans out of his way to get the donkey from Bethany to ride on. He didn't have to get a donkey to get to Jerusalem. He walked all the way from Galilee. I'm pretty sure he could have walked the, walked the remaining couple of kilometers. But even... But instead, he chose to ride into Jerusalem to emphasize his importance and to fulfill prophecy. Even the choice of Bethany and Bethphage as the town to go past was significant, as well as being close to Jerusalem, close enough that he could return there for the night rather than staying in the city. Bethany was also the home to Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. It was where he raised Lazarus from the dead. So many of the crowd who had seen him do that, who had heard about him raising Lazarus, would have been in that crowd proclaiming that. Jesus deliberately traveled through where he had a strong supporter base together. There are slight variations in the triumphal entry stories across all four of the Gospels, and they all kind of highlight different elements. But one of the things that John's version highlights is that he attributes much of the crowd to having seen or heard about the raising of Lazarus. As it says, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. Jesus was probably deliberate in gathering that crowd and it, possibly even what they were chanting was pointing towards who he was claiming to be. And let's look at what those crowds are chanting. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The crowd here are clearly anticipating Jesus as a messianic figure. They're saying, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. It doesn't get much more explicitly about the Messiah than that. They're all saying this coming now as they're coming into the city. And Hosanna as they're crying means save, we pray. They're expecting this to be the coming of the Messiah. They're expecting to this to be their salvation from the Romans. Now, if you or I were to start being worshipped in that way, if we were to get on a donkey and people were to start yelling that at us, the right thing to do would be to correct them in what they are saying. Much as in Acts, Paul and Barnabas frantically deny the crowds when they start worshipping as Zeus and Hermes in the book of Acts. But Jesus doesn't do that. He does not rebuke the crowds. Instead, the opposite of that happens. In Luke's telling of the story, 
the Pharisees come up to Jesus and tell him exactly that. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus' response is the exact opposite. He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now that is an incredibly bold statement, if you actually think about it. It's the opposite of what the Pharisees are after. The implication here is that the praise and declarations that the crowds are giving him are so right and so necessary that if they were to fall silent, creation itself would cry out instead to fill the void. Now that has got to be a claim to inherently be God. He's echoing so many of the Psalms that speak of creation itself worshipping the Creator, such as in Psalm 96. 96. Let all the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound, and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant, and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in faithfulness. There is a righteousness to the wo- and a rightness to the worship of God, and it expands beyond the people of God to all of creation, but also then to Jesus. It is only right for the whole of creation to worship God, nothing else. And so by Jesus claiming this, He's claiming deity by saying that creation itself would worship him. Jesus is done with the hidden kingdom that he proclaimed at the start of the book. He knows that this is the final week of his life, and he's bringing his claims to the front. Now, of all the things that I've listed, I don't really have time to go into all of them. I've gone through a couple, but if you wanted to look at some of these later or talk to me after, we could. But he's riding in a procession. He's making... He's mimicking the entry of a king or a general to Jerusalem. He's pulling in a large crowd. He's he's accepting worship from that crowd. He's deliberately fulfilling a prophecy. He's claiming the donkey as the Lord needs it. That's a word for God. (laughs) He's emulating the declaration of Solomon's kingship many centuries ago, the first son of David. In the passage immediately before this, at the end of chapter 10, the beggars are calling him the son of David. He's riding an unbroken animal that no one has ever done, has ever ridden. That is hard to do. (laughs) Jesus is not being subtle about his claims as he enters Jerusalem. But at the same time, he is not fulfilling people's expectations of him. He is a contradictory king. For all the clear signs of Jesus claiming kingship in the triumphal entry, there are also the clear undertones of this not being the way that people were expecting. It's, in some ways, a triumphal entry is what some of the disciples are expecting. Just in the previous chapter, two sections ago, I think Leighton talked about it a couple of weeks ago, um, James and John came up to Jesus and asked, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. When the disciples expected Jesus to ride in Jerusalem, they were expecting him to be in power. They're expecting Jesus to set up the kingdom in Jerusalem this week. When Jesus, when the crowds are chanting Hosanna, save us, we pray, they're expecting this to be their time of liberation from the Romans. But what happens is still a subversion of their expectations. This isn't how the disciples expected it to go. The most obvious way that this is a subversion of their expectations is the fact that Jesus is riding on a donkey. This is a feature that can get lost in cultural differences and also general familiarization with the gospel stories, but he's on a donkey. Not, oh, how sweet and sentimental Jesus on a donkey, Mary on the donkey on the way to Bethlehem. As I said earlier, this entry procession is mirroring that of a conquering king or general. But the conquering king or general is always on a war horse or a carriage. A grand, majestic creature, the epitome of strength and one of the most powerful weapons of war of the day. They didn't ride on a donkey. Donkeys are not majestic. They're not sleek. They're not strong. 
They're beasts of burden with the common people. They're what you put your goods on or your pregnant wife on. They are not what you put a king on. Riding on a donkey makes it almost a parody of the triumphal entry of other historical figures. Now, imagine that you're in one of those military parades, but at the peak of it, at the central focus of it all, you don't have a grand carriage or any sort of splendor. But instead, you have Kim Jong-un or King Charles riding a tricycle. That is not going to happen without Photoshop. You can imagine a bit of the confusion on the disciples' part. The Messiah has come, but he has not come as they expected him. He has not come in strength and might, but he has come in peace. Indeed, it shows the counterintuitive nature of Jesus' kingship, how his kingdom is not of this world. He is a king, but not like any that the world would produce. And this is something that the disciples have been struggling with since Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Messiah in chapter 8. By coming on a donkey, Jesus is emphasizing that he's bringing peace and not war. Matthew's telling of the triumphal entry ties Jesus' behavior, coming on a donkey, to a prophesy to a prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew, t- Matthew's ties, and quote, ends here. But the following passage is also significant, and he probably expected his audience to be able to fill it in as context. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. It is both proclaiming peace and rule, but not with might, the strength of war, but through the lowly donkey. This prophecy gives you the great contrast, coming righteous and victorious, but at the same time lowly and riding on a donkey. The disciples were ready for the righteous and victorious part, but not really for the lowly and riding on a donkey part. This is what it means for Jesus, but what does it mean for Jesus to be lowly? The lowly part is so core to who Jesus is, and that is what is so revolutionary about Christianity. It is one thing to have a God who is far away, holy and glorious. That's kind of the default view. But it's another thing entirely to have a God who is willing to make himself lowly. Now, this is not the lowliest point of Jesus' ministry, despite the donkey. The God of the universe came down to be born as a helpless baby. He ate amongst the rejects of society. He touched the untouchable. And then, at the, and then there's his arrest, trial, and crucifixion coming within a week of this event. But for Jesus to be lowly, it means that he's approachable. When he walked on earth, he wasn't only accessible to the high and mighty. To those, he was more likely to be critical of them than accepting. But he accepted the little children, those who knew their weakness and dependency. And that means he's accessible to all of us. If we can approach him from a lowly point ourselves, not by our strength, but in our weakness. It also means that if we are to follow him, we are to have nothing to fear in taking a lowly position. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if we emphasize or cling to positions of strength and power, if we are never willing to be humble or to lose, we are not actually following in his footsteps. We've strayed from them. For all the coming of the kingdom, it's not a kingdom that is as the world expects. It's been abundantly clear through the gospel so far that it is not going to be what the disciples or the crowd expect it to be. Jesus has already prophesied his death multiple times. 
And this entry into Jerusalem is going to come to an apparent total miserable failure at the end of the week. As humiliating as the Romans can make it. When Jesus try, when Peter tries to pull things back to the plan by attacking the servants who are arresting Jesus, Jesus rebukes him. Jesus doesn't answer back at all against any of the accusation of the priest during his trial. He only answers two questions that he is also answering now. Are you the king of the Jews? And are you the Christ? And so this kingdom is so unexpected, but it happens because his kingdom is not only one of power, but also one of lowliness. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, presenting himself as the king, but not necessarily through his strength. Jesus doesn't rule by coming into Jerusalem and driving out the Romans. The weak doesn't... And with Jesus grabbing a whip and driving Pilate and Herod out of his palaces, as he does at the temple. It ends with Pilate whipping Jesus and then crucifying him. Ironically, with the correct designation above his head, the king of the Jews. The very thing that he is claiming to be here. But Jesus isn't leaving any wiggle room in people's interpretation of who he is as he comes up to Jerusalem. By entering Jesus this way, he's forcing the hands of the priests, scribes, and Pharisees. He's making a very clear statement about who he's claiming to be. They can either accept him or reject him. But he's clearly not going to be just another teacher. He is not going to fit in with their expected behavior and traditions. They certainly can't ignore him. He has become the talk of the entire city by his entry. The way he's entered alone is likely to raise the alert level in the Roman army. There's a massive crowd out there yelling about the coming kingdom of David. Now that is probably going to raise concerns if you're an, from an occupying army that would definitely not describe itself as of David. They already have a king, Caesar. And they generally kill people for claiming to be a king. Indeed, one of the questions that gets asked of Jesus in the next chapter is about paying taxes to Caesar. Indeed, it's only a day later, according to Mark, that the chief priests and scribes start looking to how they can kill him. They are not willing to bow. But he's come to flip the tables, both metaphorically and literally. He's leaving the people of Jerusalem with two options. They can either acknowledge him and crown him, despite not being the Messiah, kind of Messiah that they expect, or they can kill him as they pretend they're claiming to be the Son of God. There's not really a middle ground option open for them. Now, Jesus knows what they're going to choose. It's only five days after this that the chief priests arrest him, and the crowds that are currently calling for his kingship are instead shouting, crucify him. Now, I'll admit, that turnaround from adoration to a call for execution is one of the things that stands out to me the, as most strange about the passion narrative from here until the end of the book, how quickly they, the crowd swings to rejection. But just because we're removed from these events by millennia and thousands of kilometers, doesn't mean we can necessarily avoid the question either. When it comes to looking at the claims that Jesus makes to be the promised king, to be God, the only rational responses are to either follow him or to reject him, to crown him or to crucify him. It doesn't make sense to simply view Jesus as a little helper or a source of wise sayings, or a good teacher as the rich young ruler called him last week. He is either who he claims to be or not worth following. And to crown him doesn't necessarily mean just to assent, to say yes to him. It is to crown him over all aspects of your life. As Tamara picked out this morning from the song she shared, to crown him when you bury and crown him when you marry. If he is king, then he needs to be accepted as such. He is a lowly king, 
a gentle king, and many other seemingly contradictory qualities. But he won't be anything but king. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, King Jesus, help us to see more fully the glory of your kingship and to set you at the centre of our lives. May we more fully understand what it means for you to be king. Now, I thank you that you do not just come in splendour, but lowly and approachable, bringing peace and not only judgment. Help our hearts to grasp and understand this more. I pray this in your name. Amen.